Well, well, well. Chip takes a travel day and the markets move high. Oh, hold on a second. You know, when I wrote that about a half hour ago, corn was higher. Soybeans were up double digits, as were uh, the wheats. I don't know. Something's happened here. I've got a super interesting conversation planned this morning with a company that aims to turn manure into electricity. Then we'll open the chute on this morning's Farmer Forum. Live from a single-seater news cruiser via Farm Journal Studios, this is Agritalk. This morning, we begin with a conversation with Michael Lerner from Energy Vision. Then it's our Farmer Forum with panelists Jed Bauer and Scott Berger. I'm flying solo today. It's me, your outstanding host du jour, Davis Michelson. Thanks so much for tuning in today on this Wednesday morning. Um, we've we've got a lot to talk about, and I'm really anxious for the uh, conversation coming up in the next segment with Michael Lerner. And I just I feel like I need to lay a little bit of groundwork here. All right, brace yourselves, gang. Ready? Flatulence. I'll I'll say it again. For the people in the back, flatulence. Let's get all of our giggles out of the way uh, because uh, Michael Lerner from Energy Vision is going to talk to us about a, uh, you know, when, when the Green New Deal first was was being kicked around, there was a lot of talk about cow farts, okay? Flatulence, if you like. I'm going to use flatulence. Um, and it was even written in, in some of the early drafts of the, the Green New Deal, uh, which is sort of some would argue came out under a different name called the Inflation Reduction Act, but all that aside, flatulence, methane is what we're talking about here. Um, methane has been pointed to as one of the causes for global warming, something that, that the agriculture community needs to work on. We'll dig deeper into that, but Energy Vision has a, a solution that Michael Lerner wants to talk about, and I'm super psyched about solutions uh, I'm happy to bring this conversation to you. We'll see where it goes. I don't know. I'm not a science guy. This may shoot way over my head in a big hurry. We're going to try and keep it down so that I can understand it. Um, and, and hopefully you will be able to, uh, to grasp it as well because it's a super cool concept. Um, we'll, we'll get to all of that and much more. And then Jed Bauer. I don't know if I've ever spoken to Jed Bauer personally. He's been on the show. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm anxious to get an update from him. And uh, Scott Berger, possible burger himself, we got him. Uh, he texted me a little earlier. He's loading up the planter, but he uh, he expects to be ready here in just a little bit. We'll uh, pick up the farmer form at the bottom of the hour. But for now, uh, let's begin with today's news. Lots to get to. National Weather Service weather calls for unsettled weather spreading into parts of the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, and Southeast today. Hazardous heat is possible across South Florida and South Texas this week. Signific significant excuse me flash flooding possible across portions of east texas and into louisiana on thursday so we've got unsettled weather spreading into the midwest uh, and into the southeast mid-atlantic hazardous heat elsewhere uh, deeper south south florida south texas um, and let's do be watching out for some flooding there in east texas and louisiana um, today and tomorrow Private exporters reported sales of 180,000 metric tons of soybeans for delivery to unknown destinations. Of the total, 120,000 metric tons is for delivery during the 23-24 marketing year, and 60,000 metric tons is for delivery during the 24-25 marketing year. We're seeing some more daily export sales here. Um, you know, it's been Mexico that's been showing up for corn. We've got unknown here. I wonder if you spell unknown uh, similarly to the way you spell China. Unknown. On day one of the Wheat Quality Council's HRW Wheat Tour, scouts found an average yield of 49.9 bushels per acre on samples taken from central and northern Kansas. That's up from just 29.8 bushels per acre along the same routes last year. Uh, the five-year average there is 42.7 bushels per acre. Scouts reported varied conditions and varied yield potential from the fields sampled. <laughs> However, dude, if I'm looking at this, a 49.9 on samples taken from uh, where it was 29.8 last year, um, you know, that's the kind of variability a, a guy kind of looks for, I guess. I don't know, man. 49.9 on a 29.8 last year. That uh, it sounds like a decent result, but um, long way to go on that uh, Wheat Quality Council's HRW Wheat Tour, and we'll keep you posted on that. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District 
of Columbia Circuit ruled EPA lawfully exercised its discretion in setting biofuels blending requirements for 2020 through 2022. Oil refiners had challenged the rule, arguing the standards were too high. Meanwhile, producers of cellulosic biofuels also challenged the rule, saying the standards for cellulosic biofuel were too low. The Energy uh, International Energy Agency reduced its 2024 global oil demand growth forecast to 1.1 million barrels per day, down by just 140,000 barrels per day from its previous outlook. That's on weaker demand in developed OECD countries. Factors such as poor industrial activity and a mild winter, particularly in Europe, contributed to the adjustment. A small adjustment there. Uh, and I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna rock the crude oil markets or not. Let's let's have a look here. The June WTI is down sixty seven cents, seventy seven thirty five. July at seventy seven even is down sixty five cents so far in uh, mid morning trade. Well, China has uh, reacted angrily to the Biden administration's announcement of new tariffs on electric vehicles, critical minerals, and some solar equipment. The Chinese Ministry of Commerce stated China would take quote resolute measures to safeguard its own rights and interests and demanded that the U.S. cancel the additional tariffs. Domestically, Americans are increasingly falling behind on their credit card bills with nearly one in five users having maxed out their borrowing, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Younger people and residents of low-income neighborhoods are particularly likely to be at or near their credit limits. In April 2024, the annual inflation rate in the United States eased to 3.4% from 3.5% in March. The Consumer Price Index rose by 0.3% from the previous month. That's down from a 0.4% rise in the prior two months and below expectations. Significant contributors to this monthly increase were the indices for shelter and gasoline, which together accounted for over 70% of the rise. Economists caution that one month of encouraging data was far from enough to set inflation worries to rest. Fed Chair Jerome Powell reiterated a cautious approach to monetary policy, citing the strong U.S. economy and persistent inflation. Speaking in Amsterdam, Powell expressed expectations for inflation to decrease monthly to lower levels seen last year, but acknowledged lower confidence in this forecast. House Ag Chair Committee Glenn uh, G.T. Thompson and Senate Ag Chair Debbie Stabenow met to discuss the upcoming Farm Bill with a House Committee markup scheduled for May 23rd. Thompson expressed a commitment to resolving differences between the House and Senate versions of the bill, emphasizing the need for significant funding beyond the $5 billion identified by Stabenow. Copper futures hit a record high above 5 bucks per pound overnight, Tighter global supplies, better world economic growth, smelter issues in China, and rampant market speculation are driving copper prices sharply higher. The Biden administration has initiated a new $1 billion weapons deal for Israel. This move comes despite a pause in the shipment of 2,000-pound and 500-pound bombs to Israel due to concerns about their use in densely populated areas. Let's leave it there for the news right now. Coming up next, I've got Michael Lerner, Director of Research and Publications for Energy Vision. Uh, We're talking about anaerobic digesters, methane. We're talking about flatulence. Keep it together, people. This is an adult conversation. And then after that, of course, we've got our Farmer Forum. Excited to talk to Scott Berger and Jed Bauer. We'll have more coming up next on AgriTalk. AgriTalk is brought to you by Atticus, providing battle-tested chemistries you know and trust. Welcome back to AgriTalk, everybody. Your pal, Davis Michelson here in for Chip. Chip is traveling to the glorious city of fountains. We'll be broadcasting together live from Kansas City tomorrow all day long. In the meantime, uh, I'm here with y'all. This uh, my first guest here. Before I bring him in, let me just lay some more groundwork. I'm going to say it again. Flatulence. Okay, let's all get used to that word, flatulence. Uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts introduced the Green New Deal in House Resolution 109 in February 2019. The forerunning document is where we find flatulence, 
Uh, if you'll allow me, I uh, I do have that work in front of me. I'm just going to read you a little bit where that comes from because it's come up again and again and again. This, as far as I know, is the original source. I'm quoting this uh, this sort of precursor to the Green New Deal. It says, quote, we set a goal to get to net zero rather than zero emissions in 10 years because we aren't sure that we'll be able to fully get rid of farting cows and airplanes that fast. But we think we can ramp up renewable manufacturing, power production, retrofit every building in America, build the smart grid, overhaul transport and agriculture, plant lots of trees, and restore our ecosystem to get to net zero. Okay, politics aside, let's let's not even make this a political. This is what we're dealing with here. Uh, let me bring in Michael Lerner now. Michael Lerner, Director of Research and Publications for Energy Vision. Uh, good morning, sir. I am super psyched to have this conversation with you, brother. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Davis. Very happy to be on the program. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you here because you're bringing information um, that that really needs to be in the minds of the ag community. Let me we're we're going to have a conversation about the anaerobic digesters. We'll def, we'll we'll define that. Um, but a quote from you, Mr. Lerner: Anaerobic digesters are the missing piece that can get us the rest of the way to 30 by 30, a fully commercial technology, and they're scaling fast from 60 operational facilities in the U.S. in 2017 to over 300 today. That's impressive growth. Uh, Michael, talk to us about Energy Vision before we get too deep here. Of course. So Energy Vision is a national nonprofit, and we research clean technologies that are available and commercial today and that are essential for a sustainable future. So we write reports, we host workshops, we have uh, plenty of talks to small gatherings, and we just, we're all about uh, having data behind our information. So we have the facts and we're place a high priority on outreach and education. You were the lead author on a recent report, Meeting the Methane Challenge, How the U.S. Can Reach Its 2030 Goal. Michael, we've we've talked with the audience. It's it's been a while since we talked to the audience about thirty by thirty. Can you just give us a little primer on thirty by thirty? Because that's really where your work is focused, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. So uh I'll just quick start by saying how important it is to cut methane now. Ooh, and okay. that's the whole point behind thirty by thirty. Um Just real fast, methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, over 80 times stronger than carbon dioxide. And as a result, if we can cut methane soon, it's the strongest lever we have available to slow global warming. So 30 by 30 is what the international scientific community came up with to cut methane emissions at least 30% by 2030. This is pretty much our only way of slowing global warming and avoiding all the catastrophic climate change disasters of unchecked global warming. And uh, 30 by 30 is not going to be an easy goal to reach by any means, not for the U.S., not for other countries. So there's been a lack of uh, concrete plans of how to get there. And that's where Energy Vision has stepped up. Okay. Um, and and I think that's where we can meet up with the farmer. Um, a lot of folks out in farm country sort of concerned about things like 30 by 30. They bristle at the idea of a Green New Deal uh, because there has been language. They're afraid, well, they're going to try and, and eliminate animal agriculture. There won't be any more cows because of the methane. Well, your company has found a way that maybe cows and that methane can can be dealt with in a healthy ecosystem. Talk about anaerobic digesters, please. Of course. And I just want to mention that and and reiterate multiple times that agriculture is the crucial backbone to the economy. This is not something that can be phased out. It's not something that's going away. It's essential. And so what we've done is found a way for American agriculture to play this uniquely important role in continuing to operate, continuing to provide the food and jobs and and uh, national food security, especially, that we need while also helping to address the climate problem. So um, I I don't want to this associate in any way with the Green New Deal or other political things. We're we're talking about how businesses, how farmers Mm -hmm. can can make a real difference whilst remaining profitable and in business. Mm -hmm. So anaerobic digesters are what it comes down to. Um, Now, these are 
either airtight tanks or covered lagoons where organic waste, and we're talking manure here, uh, or food waste or a mix of both, uh, that's sent into these tanks or lagoons and they're sealed so no air is getting in and they break down, uh, you know, they decompose inside and instead of the methane rich uh, biogas escaping into the atmosphere where it would cause lots of global warming, it's captured and then it can be used to generate renewable electricity or it can be used to generate renewable natural gas which can displace fossil fuels but has no fracking or drilling or leaky production process that, that's really interesting on the agricultural side there and um your report mentions that uh, these anaerobic digesters when installed on a on an operation provides crucial extra income for medium-sized farms. What do you mean by that? What is that? So the energy that is produced from anaerobic digesters, the, either electricity or renewable natural gas, that's then sold to either the grid or the gas pipeline network, and that's bringing in extra revenue to the farmers rather than this methane escaping into the atmosphere bringing no money to anyone and just posing a liability for the climate. We're talking that, let's take a dairy farm. They're producing milk, obviously, or other dairy products as the primary good. But then we're talking instead of manure being this kind of loss that they have to deal with, that's generating electricity or renewable natural gas. It's another source of income, which is crucial because a lot of farms are need this, the margins are tight enough as it is um oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna see if i can say this right we had a had a gentleman on the show a week or so ago saying that uh, conservation is just a, a conversation without compensation and and you're you're providing that that compensation there that may incentivize some farmers to look into this but it's not just farms that that you guys are looking at um i have it on may 7th EPA's new source performance standards for oil and gas production took effect, tightening methane regulations across millions of pieces of equipment. Um, according to your analysis at Energy Vision, if implemented by 2029, that legislation would cut U.S. methane emissions by 17.5%, but that doesn't get us to 30, does it? That's right. So what's going to fill the gap? And that's where anaerobic digestion comes in. Mm -hmm. we, we calculated that manure and food waste but meeting the maximum potential in the US to have anaerobic digesters process that to get us the other portion and then more. So 13.6%, if you add that to 17.5, we're talking 31.1%. That's exceeding the 30 by 30 goal. It mm -hmm. can be done, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and Let's see. You you mentioned renewable natural gas. I'm I'm looking at the clock here. Talk to me about renewable natural gas. How would how do you collect it? What I'm this is a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And it's I just want to emphasize this isn't some new technology. This is now uh, an industry that's grown by leaps and bounds over the past couple of years. Um. But essentially the gas collected by an anaerobic digester that's made from manure or food waste, it can be upgraded, purified essentially, to be the same standards that fossil natural gas you'd get in any pipeline would be. And then when it's that pure enough, it can be uh, used to heat buildings, it can be used to uh, fuel heavy duty trucks and transportation. Um, and there are now established markets uh, especially on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, they have various transportation markets that incentivize the use of renewable natural gas because they're trying to get especially diesel fuel and other very high emitting fuels out of the mix. So renewable natural gas burns a lot cleaner than diesel uh, and it doesn't have the fossil fuel emissions from production like fracking does. So it's really win-win wow. yeah. and mm -hmm. uh sorry go ahead yeah oh no no uh that that all sounds fantastic uh, we're, we're running low on time how do we get more information on energy vision michael oh please uh contact us we want to hear what the ag sector is doing any projects uh www.energy-vision.org 
energy-vision.org. Michael Lerner, fascinating. Uh, I really appreciate what you folks are doing there. Keep up the good work. Uh, we'll talk again sometime on AgriTalk. Thank you. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady. Uh, Brian, soybeans higher, wheat sort of higher, corn turns negative on us, bro. We looked good to start. Yeah, we had uh, pretty solid gains, uh, strong gains in, in some of those markets, uh, Davis, earlier today. But uh, we backed off. We hit a kind of a soft patch uh, about a half an hour or so ago. And, and uh, you know, but uh, I think the, the key here is that uh, um, we've seen buyer interest start to rebuild a little bit off uh, those earlier uh, pullback lows in the soybean market. Uh, the meal market's trading to the upside, even soy oils uh, a little bit firmer here. And uh, so the soy complex is kind of leading us. Uh, wheat was the upside leader earlier, uh, but now it's backed off. The winter wheat markets are still modestly higher. Spring wheat futures is a little bit weaker. And uh, the corn market, because those other markets have backed off of their highs, uh, it has lost some ground. And, and like you said, trading a couple cents lower here in mid-morning. Well, and the cattle complex is kind of taking a page out of the corn book here, higher up until just a little bit ago. Yeah, and uh, pretty directionless not right now, to be honest with you. So just kind of waiting, uh, waiting on uh, cash cattle trade to develop. And, and probably going to be late in the week again this week. That seems like a broken record, uh, just a repeated story from the uh, past couple weeks here. But, uh, um, you know, wholesale beef prices are really strong right now and, and surging uh, this week. And, and movement's been strong, too. So that's giving us some price support and limiting seller interest there. Uh, now, we, we had a uh, poor finish Monday and a strong finish yesterday so we'll see how we finish up uh, with today's price action and then the hog market uh, boy traders just continue to take premium out of June futures uh, in rel- uh, relation to the uh, cash index all right uh, and we've got uh, let's see crude oil is now turned slightly higher markets now on AgriTalk <laughs> Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. You're listening to AgriTalk, where the conversation begins. Join us at 855-4-TALK-AG. Welcome indeed back to AgriTalk. Your pal Davis Michelson here. Um, glad you're with us this morning. I got a, got a farmer forum coming up. The farmers are in the chute. We're going to open the gate here in just a second. Um, let me address this conversation with Michael Lerner, Director of Research and Publications from Energy Vision. Um, what I liked about that conversation, and yes, I, I did quote from from AOC and Senator Markey um, to sort of introduce where this concept of, of cattle being demonized for their emissions, shall we say, uh, that's kind of where it started. So we, we began there, but I love that it was an an apolitical and non-political conversation because gang this 30 by 30 thing um from a legislative side if that's what we have to deal with and that's what we have to figure out how to do whether we agree that global warming is man-made or natural or not happening at all none of that matters because this is these are the rules we hopefully can avoid a regulatory environment but th- these are the these are the rules in which we need to we need to function or at least be educated. And, I mean, this is growing quickly. They they had 60 operational facilities with these anaerobic digesters in 2017. Now there's over 300 of them today. That's moving in the right direction. And the kickback is farmers can uh, benefit from that by producing some electricity, some renewable natural gas. I'm, I'm going way off. Um, I'm off the trail here. Let's, let's start our farmer forum. I'm going to start. Let me bring in Jed Bauer. How's it going, Jed? We got you, Jed. All right. Well, how about the possible burger, okay, Scott? Got- oh, there's Jed. Yes. Sorry, sorry about that. I I got dropped and got back in. Didn't realize I had to unmute again. Sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, Jed, I don't know if you and I have ever actually spoken uh, mono a mano. Uh, for the listeners and for for my own benefit, roughly where are you where are you coming from? What are you doing? Uh, what's your deal, brother? Sure, and you're right. I don't think we've had the pleasure. Um, yeah. so I'm in Southwest Ohio, a town called Washington Courthouse. Uh, raised corn, soybeans, and then 
try to stay kind of active in the community and in the act world. Um, serve on the Ohio Corn Checkoff and then also uh, director of National Corn Growers. Oh, outstanding. Um Southwest Ohio, uh, are you are you pretty wet over there? What's uh, what's it look like? Um, we, we had a good run early, and like a, like a lot of the corn growing area now, we're we're pretty wet, just kind of sitting back and waiting. Uh, rain again today, rain yesterday, rain again tomorrow. Oh boy! Yeah. Are you are you feeling at all close to done? Um. I, I hate to say it. Personally, I am done. Um, okay. My, my, my corn's up. Stand looks great. It's beautiful. I honestly need one more day, and I'll be done side dressing. Um, mm-hmm. And we have a lot of corn up. A lot of corn looks good in the area. Guys took advantage of getting in early. Um, but we also have a lot of planters in the area sitting idle right now. Okay. All right. Uh, Scott Berger texted me earlier today. He was loading up his planter. Mr. Berger, what's your story? Yes, sir. I am sitting in my planter. It is not idle, and things are going well. <laughs> okay. What, a, what? When things are going well on the burger spread, what uh, what does that look like? Well, I'm watching my planter do a pretty decent job of putting corn in the ground, and I can flip the screen and watch the soybean planter roll at the same time. Technology wow. is... Uh, Amazing when it works and uh, beautiful to have. Uh, that, that's really cool. The uh, the technologies that you can bring right into the tractor cab there. Um, Jed was talking, and I I've heard from other folks out in the Eastern Belt. You're in Central Iowa. Um, it's been a bit of a stop and go. You know, b- big progress made at least in the Eastern Belt early on, and then a and then a pause. Um, and uh, some in Jed's case still waiting for that pause to end. What's your spring been like for planting? Yes, we took advantage of that early planting window. What was it? The uh, 14th, 15th, 16th, I believe, is what we had for a window here. We were able to knock in oh, about 50% of our soybeans and roughly 30% of our corn. And then it's kind of been hit and miss. I would have a 12 to 14 hour window on some drier pieces of ground that I would go sneak some corn in on. And then now, I apologize, I haven't slept for a while, but I believe it was <laughs> Monday I started up again. And today is Wednesday, and the end is in sight. All right. All right. So you're at the point where you don't know what day it is anymore. You might be about done. Um, Jed, what are, what are you thinking about in the meantime? While the uh, while the planter's parked, uh, what occupies your thoughts? Oh, I mean, you talk to anybody in ag anymore, and, and our minds go in so many different directions. You know, we're, we're having all these thoughts. We're looking, you know, you get on so many different areas. And, and, and one, now we're talking carbon scores and all this and that. And, and now we got the Department of Treasury going to weigh in on them. We've never worked with the Department of Treasury before. And, and how do we handle that? And, you know, again, looking forward, I mean, is the moisture going to continue? Are we going to have a drought? I mean, there's so many avenues in agriculture we can, we fall in those rabbit holes from time to time. And, and, you know, I mean, talking last month, it was mental health awareness. And and you know how farmers deal with that. So, you know, it's our mind go in so many different directions. It's hard to keep up anymore. Well, yeah. um, Scott, what... uh... What's running through your mind as you're as you're steering down the rows? Oh uh, man, I concur with everything that Jed said. I yeah, mean, he's me got too. his hand on the pulse of uh, the the corn growers and last month's mental health. I mean, it just it only takes a couple of minutes to check in on the neighbors, check in on the parents, heck, even do a reflection on how yourself is um, handling some of the stress. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a couple of fingernails break because of lack of, of nutrients going in my body, but I feel good mentally. You know, Jed touched on the carbon score and the B, B40 credits and all this other stuff that's coming at us. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting pulled in 100 different directions. I don't know 
what to do. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, right now, I'm I'm concentrating on getting the crop in, getting it taken care of, getting things sprayed. But, you know, in the back of your mind, it's, okay, well, do I got to start planning? Is this field going to need cover crop next year? What is the government going to yeah. say about this? Are we going to keep things separate? I mean, like you said, there's so many different uh, directions that your mind can be pulled. And I, I don't even have as much on my plate as the town like Jed has. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of where yeah. my scatterbrain can go. Yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 I'm in the same boat as uh, as you two fellas, Jed. I wonder if you would dig a little bit deeper. You put the Treasury Department and carbon in the same sentence there. Um, I, <laughs> that just sort of makes me bristle a little bit. C- can you give us some more details on what you meant by that? Well, sure. I mean, it's a whole new world, and and, and as all the listeners and growers out there start looking at these carbon, you know, you'll, you'll hear us talk. On, uh, and whether it's National Corn or uh, American Soybean Association, you'll hear us talk about using green models and how, how the government weighs out these carbon intensity scores. And so when you start going in and going down those rabbit holes, the government wants to talk about tax credits for the companies utilizing that. So, for instance, like SAF, the Sustainable Aviation Fuel, the government wants to put in some carbon score goals to give out tax credits for that and we start looking at these models on how the government sets the models up and how we want them to use current models but yet they want to modify those models to their liking and when you do that and you start adding in tax credits well then that's when the treasury department comes in because the treasury department has to weigh in on the tax credit side of things so it's kind of a new realm for us yeah, it, it's a. Uh, and I don't. Uh, yeah. It's it's a whole. I don't want to get too far in the weeds because it gets confusing. Well, yes, and I, I get confused very easily, Jed. So, uh, um, this this little bit here is is good. Um, you know, Scott, with the carbon and sequestration and all these words being floated around, you know, most farmers are still kind of trying to grapple with. You know, I don't know if I'm really buying the climate change thing or not. I think that what we need to do is put that aside. Because we're we're now dealing with a potentially uh, regulatory environment with with carbon, with methane, with emissions in its sites. Um, do you see it that way as well, or do we just need to continue to um, those who feel led to push back against climate change? Um, so back can be a very touchy subject. Uh, yeah. You know, where I sit. As these things are coming down in the chute, they're either going to beat us a carrot or beat us with a stick. And if these things, these carbon scores, these tax credits, and whatever you want to call them, can add to my bottom line, I need to be taking advantage of it. So whether that's getting into a carbon program with one of my end producers or tracking my PI score, whatever it is, if it's going to improve my bottom line, I at least have to be looking at it and be prepared for what's to come. Jed, if there's a little give back in it, I think you uh, you'll see farmers very interested in some new technologies and uh, ways to ways to improve businesses done. Fair? Oh, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, we're we're for the most part early adopters on anything that makes us you know more sustainable, and more profitable in our operations. But I think yep. the key as we do this is is we have to make everyone understand that one set of rules does not fit everyone in agriculture. Yes, Ooh. we all do it a little differently, and we all yep. try to do the best we can. But each re- each region, you know. Ooh. We'll come back to that on the other side of the break, Jed. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, Agritalk is live every weekday. In fact, we're live right now, beloved listener. Thank you so much for tuning in. Your pal, Davis Michelson, here in for Chip Flory today. This afternoon, uh, we've got the pride of Chicago. Ted Seifert wanted to slip into the host chair, and uh, we're more than happy to turn over the big green leafy microphone to uh, Ted Seifert, Zaner Aghedge. That'll be this afternoon. You're not going to want to miss that conversation. He's always fired up. He always brings it. Seifert brings it. 
Uh, let's get let's get back to our conversation here. I've got Scott Berger from Central Iowa and Jed Bauer from Southwest Ohio. Jed, uh, we were interrupted by the pursuit of commerce ever so rudely, um, but you were you were getting rolling. I mean, a, a a blanket approach on whatever it is, regulation, recommendations, uh, policy. Maybe we say on on carbon, on agriculture. I mean, what works for you isn't going to work in North Texas, is it? It, it really doesn't, and and our voice is more powerful than ever when it comes to things like that, and when it comes to, you know, I'll, I'll change the subject again. I mean, you know, we still have lights on endangered species and what products we can use, you know, so they're wanting us to no-till and use cover crops and so on and so forth to lower our carbon intensity score, but at the same time, they're trying to take products away that we've used for years and worse. So it, it's just a really tough situation we find ourselves in all the time. And I and I do feel like just sort of adding to the confusion when it comes to this sort of policy stuff is it's almost a little bit a la carte. They're taking from here, oh, we've got to fix that, oh, we've got to fix that. And there really isn't a, I guess maybe the 30 by 30 plan could be called their overarching plan. Scott, I don't know. You know, farmers are suffering from uncertainty right now. A lot of mental anxiety and just because we just don't know what to expect. Um, you talked about mental health a little bit. Um, man, it, it's got to got to grind on you a little bit. Yeah, it absolutely does. You know, and hitting this subject, I believe everything has a place. You know, the, the methane gas collectors are awesome in dairy. I've seen one. I've mm-hmm. been around it. They love them. And I think it's great. But you can't force that on everybody. You know, cover crops for the carbon capture happen to work in my area. But like you said, they don't work everywhere. It's it's frustrating because the people who are in Washington now trying to make these decisions and tell us how to do our job don't know the fundamentals of how our job works. So the frustration is what gets me the most when it comes to the the thoughts of what's really going to happen. Jed, there are those who would correlate the proportion of farmers in Congress to the success and overhaul, overall general health of the economy. Are you in that uh, camp there? So, I guess I, maybe I don't understand the question correctly, no. but there's, there's definitely... Definitely not enough rural voice in Congress anymore, yeah. and and we know that that's going to continue to get less and less. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you know, I've mentioned it. That's why it is so important for us to be there and have our voices heard and try to explain and educate on why we do what we do and how we are continuing to look to look at ways to be more innovative and more sustainable in what we do. Mm-hmm. And and we just. You know, I hate it because it's a never-ending battle, but we have to keep beating that drum to educate the people that don't understand what it's like for us in rural America. Mm-hmm. Well, and it helps that that we do have a burgeoning story to tell. Maybe they don't understand cover crops, and maybe they don't understand, you know, rotational cropping. Maybe they don't understand carbon capture or any of that. Um, but what we can say to folks who don't, really need the nuts and bolts of how it works hey we're doing something out here scott um you were talking about your fancy technological setup you switch to the screen and you can see the thing and you're driving the deal um would you consider yourself an early adopter of new ag technologies scott um i would say more on the bleeding edge not the cutting edge okay fair enough yeah jed you uh you uh use the word early adopter um, rather aggressively early on um, I, I wonder if you can talk to me about that and maybe talk to the farmer who's who's a little bit nervous about adopting some new technology or something I mean how do you get over the anxiety because if you blow a crop that's expensive right oh yeah there's no <laughs> doubt um, but you know as, as we look at these new practices and it you know it seems like you got to continually be trying. I mean, obviously, you know, all your listeners know you can't throw all your eggs in one basket. 
but you, you continually, we're continually looking and trying new things, and you do it on small portions. And, you know, as, as it works, you, you increase your, your acreage you do it on. Um, but that's the key. I mean, because if, if you're missing something, it, it's way more expensive in the end if you're missing out when somebody else has figured something out than if you never tried it all. Yeah. Um, but you're right. If it doesn't work at the same time, you, you don't want to have too much, you know, in that basket because that can be detrimental at the same, same time. Yep, yep, very good. Um, let's let's leave it with there and begin to close our conversation. Scott, I'm curious. I, I know that you're a, a pretty active marketer. I, I'm, have you reached out into the uh, the 25 marketing year yet, 2025? I do have some sold in 2025. But I knew it you was, would. Yep. It was a long time ago that I sold it when I was selling 24 as well. Uh-huh. I, uh, I, I called up my, my guy, Joe V, give him a shout out. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, let's sell 25 and 24 today. And he said, you sure? And I said, yes. <laughs> and obviously hindsight's 2020. It looks great. I should have sold more. But we have working orders for 24, 25 right now. And we'll see what this, um, this market does. I can't watch it all the time. So I get my working orders in and do what it is. Oh, yeah. Get a sense of it and look away. That's That's my policy. Um, Jed Bauer from Southwest Ohio, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. I really appreciate your words and your candor, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And Scott Berger, uh, thanks for being with us today. Keep going there, and uh, we we appreciate your time and your words as well, buddy. Uh, Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Davis. You too. Uh, And, of course, uh, thank you to our guest from... um, Energy Vision, there it is. It's energy-vision.org, Michael Lerner. Um, an important conversation today. Some, sometimes these can be difficult and a little bit tingly. We'll get you through it. Uh, this afternoon, we got the pride of Chicago. Ted's. Hi, Fred.